Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Free Thinking with Montan. I am so happy to have the guest on that I have today. As a matter of fact, I was very fortunate to have been able to interview her. Oh man, let me tell you, I don't want to give up days, but you know, a little while ago on the Montan Web Show, when the Montan Web Show was on back in 1999. Um, and I will tell you that this is a, a, a woman who literally changed my life. Uh, while doing that interview, I was literally suffering from the ravages of MS that I had not been diagnosed for yet. And um, literally, as I listened to her story, though she doesn't have the same you know, malady that I suffer from, um, there were so many things that we had in common. One of them was literally uh, dealing with chronic neurologic pain. And for the first time, I literally was speaking to somebody who sounded like they understood me. Um, and I understood her in a way that I had never really literally focused in on my own pain that way before. Um, she literally opened up my brain, opened up my mind, gave me the words that I needed to be able to use and explain to my doctor how I felt so that I was finally literally diagnosed with having MS. And I will say that, um, I credit my interview with uh, her as being a person that literally helped me find a voice. Um, and so I'm so glad that she's here. My guest today has had her fair share of ups and downs from becoming an iconic MTV VJ to starring in Dumb and Dumber to being diagnosed with a life-threatening neurological disease. She's a producer, an actress, a model, a best-selling author. She's here today to talk about her new book, Wise Up, <laughs> Irreverent Enlightenment from a Mother, who's been through it, in which she shares funny and enlightening uh, lessons on life and parenthood. Karen Duffy, welcome to Free Thank You with Montel. It's so good to see you again, my friend. Oh, so great to see you, Montel. Truly, uh, I carry a essentially a Mount Olympus in my head of people, mentors who have inspired me. And you're right up there. I don't know, is it Zeus or Adonis? But, <laughs> you, <laughs> but you have given me such a gift and I am so grateful. Um, you know, living with chronic pain and trying to hide it is like keeping a beach ball underwater. Oh my God, yes. And often we, there is a lot of shame connected to having pain. It's invisible, so people don't see it. And it's interesting, the word pain comes from the Latin, puona, meaning punishment or penalty. And chronic comes from the Greek time. So chronic pain is pain without measure of time. It is continual. And so, uh, I've just found so many lessons about living with pain. And probably one of the biggest is pain is inevitable. We will all live with some sort of either physical pain, like we have emotional pain, but suffering can be optional. We will live with pain, but at some point we can cohabitate and not have to suffer. So, well, I mean, look, it's really crazy. You've touched on so many things just there in this open um, that I want to talk to you about throughout this interview. Um, but let's just address a couple of them right now because I really wanted to take you back first to talk about how you even got your start in the entertainment business. Let's get there in a second. Right. The whole idea about the fact that we are all suffering. I mean, right now we're living in a time when people are coming out of, we're coming out of this this pandemic and coming out of this pandemic, realizing that some of the symptoms that so many people suffered through during their bouts of COVID. And we're realizing now that probably 75% plus of Americans have probably already had COVID. Um, now there are these long haulers that are having symptoms that have sprouted up three and four months after they actually got over COVID, now all of a sudden they've got some things that are glitches that are happening. And some of them are glitched with neuropathic pain that is out of nowhere. I, I saw a story a day ago about a woman who 
literally after having, you know, recovered from COVID three months later, it's in before she recovered from COVID, she was a, a marathoner and um, exercise. And then all of a sudden now three months after COVID, um, she is, is facing, you know, bouts of neuropathic pain. And we have so many people who are suffering from psychological pain. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I think a hundred percent of us will one day face pain head on and, um, it's, it's learning from people like yourself that, uh, will give people the dignity and grace to be able to ask the questions that they need to ask, to find the solutions that they're looking for, for them. So I'm so excited to talk to you, uh, for this hour and, and uh, let's back up a little bit because I want to make sure people understand. Uh, and yes, this is Karen Duffy, who was the DJ. But let's let's talk a little bit about how you even got your start in an entertainment business to begin with. And and when did this all begin? So let's go back to the beginning. Thank you. Um, I uh, got my degree as a recreational therapist and I loved this job. I had my family. They always believed in Shirley Chisholm's line that service is the rent we pay for living on earth. And so I always volunteered at a nursing home right around the corner from where I live now. And I've been work volunteering there since I was 12. And uh, I got my degree in recreational therapy and I was back at the same nursing home. And I just loved it. I felt confident and I understood working with uh, people on the memory care unit, people who had Alzheimer's and dementia, I had to find little tricks to have them pay attention. So moving my body, strong elocution. And I realized that everyone was saying MTV is reducing America's uh, attention span. So I thought, well, I'm the perfect person. I've, I, I know exactly how to do this. So I sent in a videotape to MTV unsolicited and I think I sent it on a Friday. I had a screen test on Tuesday. And by that Friday, I was on camera as a VJ. And I really feel that all skills are transferable. And I felt like I snuck into a party and was just waiting to get kicked out. Yeah. So I just had so much fun with it. Um, and I think, again, carrying the confidence of knowing I am a really I'm, I'm very confident as a recreational therapist. And so I figured, listen, if this goes south, I will always have something to fall back on. But I'm so grateful that I did take that risk of just making a videotape, sending it in unsolicited. And then really, I've been on this wild ride. It was wow. great. And that ride was was rocketing you in a way to the top. And you were the, one of the best BJs on MTV. And then when did you start to recognize something was wrong? It was interesting. Um, uh, I was in lavish, good health. Uh, I was young. I mean, in a way, I treated my body the way you drive a rental car. I mean, I was not aware of the grace of having perfect health until it truly felt like I got struck by lightning. Um, I was at the Emmy Awards and it's just a funny place that that's where I was. And it, it truly, it was a pain that I've, that I've never experienced and that has never gone away. And what happened was I have neurosarcoidosis. It is an, a rare disease and it, what it is a disease of an inflammatory disease. And so in my brain and spinal column, which is a contained area within your skull, the lesion grew so big that it destroyed and demyelinated a lot of the nerves. So I really, I mean, when this pain hit, I went right to the hospital and it took several years to get a complete diagnosis. And in that point, um, I then uh, lost the feeling in my hands and feet. Um, and then this quadrant of my uh, neck and shoulder has just always, always felt like there was an electric eel swimming up my spinal column. So, crazy. so I mean, when that hit you, I, I remember talking to you on the show, but I mean, did that, did that bring your professional career to an end or did it, uh, did you think that I'm never going to be able to go back in front of a camera again? What, what, what was, what, what did you feel when you first 
experience. I remember, you know, for me, just to, to throw that to you, I had just done an episode of, um, I was getting ready to do an episode of the, of the show, Touched by an Angel. Remember that one? Mm -hmm, yes. And I was on a plane literally flying out to Utah because that's where it shoots at me. And I, you know, I, I, back then I was a pretty heavy weightlifter and, you know, I had been the day before doing some really heavy deadlifts and squats. And so, um, I was sitting on a, and, uh, you know, on the plane sitting in first class and, you know, I literally made just a slight move and literally my feet went on fire. I mean, it, I can't explain it other than to say, you say lightning bolt, but I gotta tell you, I felt like I was burning and it wouldn't stop. And it just kept getting worse and getting worse, getting worse. And by the time a plane touched down, I literally, I, I, it was, it was difficult taking every single step because my feet were touching the floor and the harder my feet touched the floor, the more the flame seemed to burn up my calf and, um, up my shin. And, you know, I happened to be fortunate that I was, uh, uh, flying out to stay with a friend of mine who happened to be a doctor. And I remember walking into his house and, um, I was staying in his house rather than staying in a hotel for the shoot. And this was a Friday evening and I had to literally go in, drop off my bags, go over to the set to get fitted for a wardrobe and talk to wardrobe about what we we're going to do. And our first film day was that Monday. And, um, I, I remember just explaining to my doctor friend, man, I, I can't explain to you what this is, but my feet just won't stop burning. This is really crazy. Well, he ended up, ended up, and this was after, you know, maybe a month before that I had maybe just a lightning flash of that and it went away and another lightning flash of that. And I'm thinking that maybe I must be doing something that pinches a nerve in my back when I'm squatting. And I was squatting back then, you know, oh man, plus 400 pounds. So I'm thinking I'm putting too much weight on my back. That's what the problem is. And, you know, I saw my doctor friend and unbeknownst to me, he had said to my wife at the time, this is so weird, but I think Montel probably has MS. Let him, I'm going to send him to see this doctor that I know. And over the weekend, before I even started shooting the series, I literally went to a doctor friend of his, saw him on a Saturday. And this doctor friend of my friend said, I think you have MS. And I was like, you know, dude, get out of here. I ain't got nobody's MS. Let's stop. That's really stupid. And I went ahead and the next week, the pain was still there, but I had to kind of gut through it. So when you say, you know, you, you gut through it and try to hide it, I had no ifs, ands, or buts. That's what I had to do. And, um, you know, uh, finally, I ended up seeing a doctor in at Harvard and got the confirmation. In some ways, I got a, it was a relief because at least I understood what it was. But at the same time, I will tell you that it sent me in a spiral into an abyss. How about you? I mean, when you, you know, it was, uh, I was I was young. I was in my third. I was thirty, and it felt like. I had, with my career, I had built a plane by hand and I was on the tarmac and I was just ready to take off. Instead, I had to bring it back into the hangar. And because of this illness, I was no longer insurable to be in front of the camera. And uh, I didn't expect that a pain in my neck would essentially detonate my life. And so in a way, Montel, I had to mourn for my old life and figure out a whole new life, but that was not easy. And uh, I didn't want to fall into a hole where I couldn't get out of. And I also didn't want chronic pain to make me mean. I didn't want, I mean, I'm kind of a happy-go-lucky, glass half full, fly by the seat of my pants type of gal. And I didn't want to lose that part of my heart. And uh, it, was, it, it was a journey of several years of trying to find a way to live with purpose and a way to feel of service. Because one of the interesting things, and I don't know if this happened to you, but I did feel this I was enveloped in shame. I was so embarrassed that my body had betrayed me. Uh, it is certainly not a beauty treatment being on chemotherapy drugs for seven years. And I was a Revlon model. And uh, I know that our, all of our lives are perishable, 
but this was my career. This is what I was, how I'd made my living. And I had to find a way to make peace with my illness because I understand there's a spiritual equation that says life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. And so I tried to understand, well, this is out of my control right now. Like having this granuloma in my brain that destroyed these and demyelinated these nerves, that is, that is a fact. But how will I respond to this? And how will I be able to peacefully coexist? That was the real journey and the real struggle. And, and um, you said it took you years, and I will have to back up and say the same. It took me years to try to figure out. Well, you know, I, I will tell you, I literally jumped at the opportunity to understand that, you know, the whole journey with opioids was not the journey I should have been on. And had I, I like I had recommended to you the fact that cannabis, you know, was already being researched back then, and, and there was ways that, uh, you know, science was, was understanding. And you said 1999, but... You know, um, you got to remember that our federal government signed a patent for itself for CBD and its ability to help mitigate chronic pain back in 2001. So it was really kind of crazy that at the same time that, you know, this was happening to you and same thing happening to me. I, you know, ignored science for a little bit and followed the journey that doctors put me on, which was the opioid dance and, you know, realized that I was about to shut down my kidneys and my liver. So I literally had to shift over and, and I started experiencing figured out very early on that CBD and CBD and some of the other monocannabinoids literally helped me manage my pain in a way that opioids didn't. Um, you, you kind of experienced that also, right? Absolutely. I mean, Montel, I really feel there is a fellowship of people who live with chronic pain. And you were the first person in about 1999, 2000, you so gracefully and generously offered, you said, please look into this. There is great research and you changed my life. And I am so grateful that you had the compassion to share this with me. It's interesting, the, the Latin translation of compassion means suffering together. And you have been such a compassionate advocate and leader. And um, I have found relief. I remember the day that I first tried CBD. It was April 23rd, 2018. And some, somebody sent me, somebody, somebody who I didn't know, sent me um, some things to try. And I put it on my neck. And I will tell you, it was instant. It was an instant relief. And I remember that day because as clearly as I remember being struck by lightning with the pain, this, it's almost like having someone screaming in your ear all the time. And uh, it just quieted it. And, and, you know, it doesn't last forever. And I have found a way to absolutely live a beautiful life and squeezing the best out of it. I think every day we have a choice to be useless or useful. And I'm trying to tick more useful days in my life. But I also understand that there are times when I can't get out of bed and I am roped to the sofa like Gulliver because air hurts my neck. Um, it has been an unbelievable ride. And I am just so grateful for the voices of compassion and leadership and for all that you do for us. So thank oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Well, look, I mean, you also though dug deep into philosophy, as a matter of fact, especially stoic philosophy, and it's become an important part of your life. Explain this a little bit to us. Well, thank you. Um, I have always been very interested in the this, this Stoic way of thinking. Um, and Epictetus is my go-to. He's my main Stoic philosopher. And 
the thesis of my new book, Wise Up, is from Epictetus. And he said, if you make beautiful choices, you will make a beautiful life. And that resonated through me like a firecracker in a silverware drawer. I'm like, yes, I can still control and make beautiful choices. Epictetus is also known for the idea of the dichotomy of control, which is we can't control what happens. We can only control how we respond, which right. is actually the basis for the serenity prayer. And I have just found that um, these teachings and finding a philosophical scaffolding to essentially hold me up. And that has been a also an, another part of my treatment plan. As much as um, you know, my therapies and my medicine, it is also having a philosophy, a way that I will cohabitate and face these obstacles. Gotcha. You became a mother back in 2003 when your son Jack was born. How did parenthood change your life, change you? Well, it was amazing because I was on a, a chemotherapy drug, which killed fast growing cells. So pretty much the prime baby making years, um, I was out of business. I had closed shop I, and um, uh, becoming a mother and this journey uh, through the grace of IVF. And it changed me in such cataclysmic ways. First of all, I had no idea it would be, I thought I had so much love in my life. It's, it is just this explosion. You have this gift of life. And I love that, um, you know, your, your mother is your first home and that I was, I'm able to parent a very healthy, very funny, very happy young man. And it's been beautiful to see him embrace uh, Stoic philosophy as well. Excellent. That, that, uh, this is, he was part of the reason why you went ahead and decided to write your book, Wise Up, Irreverent Inter Enlightenment from a Mother Who's Been Through It. Tell us a little bit about the book and, and you know, why, why write it now? Well, it's interesting. I have found that uh, there's, there's an idea of the bibliotherapy um, is the idea that books can actually have a similar effect as cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, no question. That by reading, you are essentially teleported. You know, books are not lifeless lumps of paper. They are entombed minds. And I, um, we have a rule in our house where there's no technology at the table, only philosophy books and the sports pages. And he's a teenager, so he doesn't have to talk, but if, if he, you know, he can read. And um, it really became a great habit. And one of the, um, our family traditions is we pick a motto. And it's not a big deal. It's not like, you know, we just every couple months say, well, what about this? So my son was like, how about this from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, write it on your heart that every day is the best day of the year. Mm. And I think, well, that's a great way to look at the world. So I wrote Wise Up um, as a collection of letters, which is a Stoic tradition. Uh, Seneca would often speak um, to younger colleagues in a series of letters. And I also wanted the love that I, I could write it as a book of essays, but I thought if I made it letters and made it feel intimate where the reader feels this love radiating off the page. So each chapter is a letter and they're meant to be swallowed whole, just like a clam. Wow. And, and I mean, you have some other very interesting, you know, rituals that, that are really important to your family. And you think that families should create their own. Tell us a little bit about your family rituals. I will tell you what, but before you do, I'll tell you one of mine. Like, you know, when you talk about books and the importance of books, you know, when I was a child, I was the youngest of four. And one of the things that my father required because he was a shift worker. So whenever he was home at time for dinner, you know, the family had to get together and eat dinner together at the table. And one of his requirements was that, you know, all the kids had to come to the table having, um, you know, read, memorized, studied at least four words from the dictionary or three words from the dictionary. And you had to be able to spell them, 
use them in a sentence and give the Webster's dictionary um, definition of. And, you know, I mean, we were required as kids every week to go to the library, the public library, and check out at least two books that we were required to read by the end of the week. And, you know, even when I was very, very small, um, you know, my older siblings who were in school had to, my father made them teach me three words so that I could also participate in the conversation at the table. So that's where, you know, I think uh, my vocabulary came from as a small child and my, that's the reason why I can't shut my daggone mouth now. But, um, you know, uh, that was an experience for us that was really, really, really profound because, you know, every, every four to five, uh, he would be home for four days and he'd be gone for four days and he'd be back for four days. So, Almost every eight days cyclically, we would have an opportunity to, you know, proudly, you know, enumerate what it is we learned in the dictionary and talk about the books that we read. Um, you have some rituals. You just said one at the table where you can only come to the table with philosophy books or sports pages. What are some of the other rituals that your family has? Embrace well, I love um, uh, everyone wears a collared shirt at the table and um and I love this idea of finding a motto. And it doesn't have to be all from dead white guys. Jack picked a motto the other day and it was, life gives to the giver and takes from the taker, which is from Reverend Run. So I, and um, there's something that I learned, it's called a familect. And that, a familect is your own intimate familial dialogue, the vocabulary that you use, the nicknames you call each other. And I think just honoring this time, what's so beautiful, Montel, when you share your story is that you, that was a profound experience. Your fathers inspired you. And um, I love that your brothers also, you know, taught you letters and, and, and words. And um, Epictetus, uh, my main man philosopher, he said, it is in, in, in teaching others where we learn which I just think is fantastic. And um, so I like, we all um, have service. Uh, I believe in mentorship and I love that my son has become a mentor and, you know, it's not a free ride so much, you know, we have to, you know, be grateful for what we have and just share that with others and Absolutely. share your life. That's the most important thing. You know, one 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 that you can you can pass on to them. Uh, you know, it's it's one that I've kind of lived by now for years, and I used to do it uh, in a specific way where I, you know, every night before I would go to bed, and I do it now without writing it because I don't have to write it; I can remember it. But you know, um, I learned very early on that you know if I took a piece of paper and I wrote down at the end of the bed that I'm laying in bed, you know, it's that time where TV's off, everything's off, everything's done. You're you're trying to go to sleep. I make sure I wait until that moment and I then ask my question, myself a question, what did I do today that's worth talking about tomorrow? And I used to have to write it down. And so I would get up in the morning, take a piece of paper, go to the bathroom and look in the mirror and read what it was that I said yesterday. What did I do today that's worth talking about tomorrow? If you read that out loud to yourself, that starts your day off with something that's really, really enlightened and something that's really, really good. Instead of getting up in the morning and going, oh, woe is me, I'm facing a hard day. I get up in the morning and I have an accomplishment that I already did the day before. That is worth talking about this day. That literally will inspire me to figure out what is worth, what am I going to do today that's worth talking about tomorrow. And every single day, it's perpetuated. Um, so that's one that you can, you can. I love that. You know, Montel, the idea, just what you're saying is what Marcus Aurelius, who's one of the most notable Stoic philosophers. That was, he always said like, you know, what did you do today that is of merit? And mm. he really inspired journaling. And the entire book, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, it was his personal journal and it was called For Himself. And mm. he starts off in the meditation just thanking all the people who have inspired him. And um, it's interesting to point out that I feel such a deep connection to Epictetus, who was a teacher of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus um, Epictetus uh, was enslaved 
and he had a sadistic master in uh, in uh, in the Greek and Roma, Roman Empire, and the master was twisting his leg, and and Epictetus said, "If you do that, you will break it." And Epictetus lived with chronic pain. In all of his images, he is with his walking stick, and I believe that while Stoic philosophy was written 2,000 years ago, it absolutely reads as if the ink is still wet. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea that we are the sum of our choices. We dye our souls the color of our thoughts. All mm -hmm. of your traditions and journaling and being aware is all very, very stoic. What is your what's your favorite part of the book that you read? First of all, well, how did your son react to the book once he got it to read it? Well, thank you for asking. I um, when I realized the book would have this, I really wanted to have this cataclysmic, almost vibrating with good vibes and love. And I knew that if I addressed it to him, I could be cheeky because he's a young male and I can fill it with crackpot wisdom. And so I asked him for permission if I could address these letters to him. And he said, yes, mom, but I'm going to ask you to not use my nickname, not use our familect. I want you to use my real name because I'm proud of you. And so it's a series of letters about why we need a philosophy for living. And it's not that complicated. If you have an idea of how the wor world works, how much to tip people to be kind, to be a friend to yourself, you have a philosophy for living. And at the very end of the book, Jack then writes a letter back to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was incredible. And of course I asked his permission. Um, it's interesting in Europe, if a parent posts about her child on social media, that child can then sue the mother for invasion of privacy. So wow. I think it's important to be honorable and respectful and often the intimacy can kind of cloud that. Um, unfortunately, you know, this internet thing is really literally clouding that completely. People think that, you know, if I'm sitting somewhere and I take a picture of me like this and there's five people behind it, I don't care what they think if I post that picture and don't even bother to ask permission to put the other person's face you know, in a screen with them and whatever their silly comment may be to go along with it, it may not be a good interpretation of what that person felt at that same time. So exactly. I think yeah. it's, we need to be respectful to ourselves. If you respect yourself, then you will respect others. Be kind. That's, that's something that's, that's clearly missing right now in our society because, you know, some of the things people do to themselves or about themselves when they post things, isn't as respectful as they think it might be for themselves. What are five of the most important lessons you hope people will take away from your book? Well, uh, I believe most importantly, that if you make beautiful choices, you will make a beautiful life. That indeed we are the sum of our choices. I believe uh, the dichotomy of control where we can't control what happens, we can only control how we respond. Mm -hmm. um, I believe uh, another great piece is that, you know, always laugh when you can. It's cheap medicine. That's a line from uh, Lord Byron. Um, Epictetus said, it's best to take a lighter view of things for it's, for, it's more noble to laugh than lament. And uh, from Marcus Aurelius, he said, just do it. Mm -hmm. The Nike line of just do it comes right from Marcus Aurelius. He said, how long will you wait to demand the best for yourself? Right. Just do it. So that's what I'm hoping that uh, has been translated through my book, Wise Up. And um, I really, I wrote this for people who may not have a deep knowledge of Stoic philosophy. And it's been incredible that the Stoic philosophy community, the 
head of the Dean of Stoicism at Oxford. And I've been on panels with these men and they were like, how do you find all the fun stuff in philosophy? And I said, because if you look for it, you will find it. Absolutely. <laughs> if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. Correct. Yes. But and I'm not looking to make it complicated. I'm looking for the most like four words, beautiful choices, beautiful life. I like to make it as practical and as accessible as the Stoics intended. There was Absolutely. not this idea to make it dense or any way impenetrable. Absolutely. I love that this is a gift and this is uh, Clearly created to be used, not to be pondered. Exactly, exactly. It's it's meant to just you know lighten up, you know, write it on your heart. You know, in, in every day we have an opportunity. You know, it's it's never too late to get better or smarter, even when we live with chronic pain or chronic illness. And I think that that is um, that's a great gift that the Stoic. Uh, the Stoke philosophers have shared with all of us. What else have you learned though? You call yourself the hockey mom. <laughs> what else have you learned from being a hockey mom? Well, it's interesting. So my son plays at a very high competitive level for since he was six years old and he's traveled all over North America and he's a goalie and his beautiful little face is getting pucks slammed at a hundred miles an hour. And I realized that if I if I was to express too much worry, I would decant the joy that he gets from being an elite athlete. And I had to manage the way I view it, like what is in my control? This is a dangerous sport. And um, it was funny, my my, I was like, Jack, you just got so beautiful teeth. And he's like, they're only baby teeth. Don't worry about it. But I love <laughs> my son um, recently said to me, you know, mom, as Aristotle said, worry is misuse of the imagination. And I've learned as a hockey mom uh, to, again, have trust in his skill because I don't want to be the person that will drain the joy. I want to be there to hopefully help him find even more joy from using his body in the way that he loves as an athlete. It's a great gift to watch. You've included a lot of that in the book also, right? Your book, and is the book really for parents? Is it for young adults? Is it for children? Is it for everyone? Who's it really for? Well, I wrote the book um, for, really for everyone. Um, but I think it is a a, a meditation on motherhood and um, stoicism has really been packaged mainly to tech bros. It's almost like broicism. And they're trying to like take this unbelievable classical wisdom and turn it into life hacks. And I wanted to have a female voice. And, um, you know, I, I told my son, you know, mothers are so incredibly awesome that nature had to synthesize a chemical to break our bond. And so as an adolescent, whether it's a male or female, you know, the hormones of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone in men, I said, at some breakfast, me biting into a slice of toast will be repellent to you. And Jack said, mom, I really don't think that. I mean, we got on real well. I don't think this is gonna be a big deal. I said, Jack, I promise you, there will be a moment where you're just like, Ugh. And we were out on the terrace and apparently I bit into a cob of corn like sea biscuit. And he was like, you were right. You were right. And I said, well, that's what nature does. So you don't wind up living in my basement. So now you can look at me differently. I now am more flawed. You will see that. And that's what adolescence is. So um, I love the fact that through these letters, um, I really wanted to, you know, I'm speaking to a young man. So it's a woman's voice, but it's kind of got some cheeky, naughty bits. So I really uh, wanted to keep it light and keep it uh, honoring the tradition of the Stoics. Um, and I believe I've succeeded. I'm deeply proud of the book. And um, it's just been uh, wonderful to be able to have this gift 
to speak to the world through books. Absolutely. Well, the book is called Wise Up, Irreverent, Irreverent Enlightenment from a Mother Who's Been Through It. What's next for the Duff? Well, um, it's interesting. Um, my son, uh, uh, when my husband travels all the time, and because my son is so athletic, I would hire male babysitters because I can't rough them up. So I would hire you know, students from NYU and my male babysitter um, was in film school. And I was like, I have an idea. And uh, his first movie won the Tribeca Film Festival, The Zen wow. of Bobby V about Val Bobby Valentine. And we made a series about hockey moms, but we just did a great documentary uh, about Bill Murray when he performed at the Acropolis with his classical quartet. It closed the Cannes Film Festival. So Bill Murray at the at the Acropolis is like Yanni, except cool. Hmm. And um, uh, I was out with this young man, Andrew Moscato, and we were, uh, he's a great wingman because my husband travels, he's begun to become part of the family. And I took him to a party, I introduced him to a journalist and uh, Andrew asked my friend, oh, you're a journalist, what's the best story that you never reported on. And she told us the story of Chickie Donahue, who in 1967, he had served in the military. And when he got back home to Inwood, five of his best friends had been uh, drafted. And it was during protests and he felt that the, his friends overseas were not getting the support. So he decided that he was going to get on a munition ship as a merchant seaman and get to Vietnam and bring his friends Pap's Blue Ribbon. And uh, this is a film, it's called The Greatest Beer Run Ever. Uh -huh. And my friend Peter Farley, who did Dumb and Dumber in the Green Book, directed, and it stars Zac Efron, Russell Crowe, and an ingenue named Bill Murray. So that wow. will be coming out in the fall. But you know, what's so wonderful is that again, it is never too late. And that is the message of my book. It's just like, again, make beautiful choices. We get offered, my partner and I, Andrew, get offered to do a lot of film. And we just decided, no, we're only gonna tell stories that we feel that will have a message of kindness, of generosity, of how far you'd go for a friend. and you know, let other people tell different stories. Um, but I believe, you know, it's interesting. People, often women say in middle age, they feel invisible. And I've never been busier because I haven't let the foot off my off the gas. And I've been able to, again, you know, one of our family mottos has been, nothing great in life has ever been achieved without enthusiasm. And so I try and stay enthusiastic. I, because I live with chronic pain and chronic illness, I have to manage my time like Scrooge McDuck manages his money. So I am a miser with my time and my energy. And then when I find something that I can really do, I, I, I throw my heart into it, but I also work with great people. And that's so all. If people want to get more information about you, Instagram, those kind of things, where do, where do they go? Thank you. Um, you can find me at, uh, at Duffy NYC at um, Instagram. And um, I have a website and that is Karen Duffy Stoic.com. Wow. Okay. Well, great. Why well, can't I say, Karen, thank you so much for being here with me. I could talk to you all day. Um, you always have a home here. Uh, if you want to just come on and just, just kick it about philosophy, I'm, I would love to do that with you. So let me know again if you can um, have time. We'll, we'll schedule you again. And I got to say thank you so much for being part of the show today. Free thinking is all about what we've just done. It's done some free thinking. So thank you, my dear. Thank you so much. You've changed my life. Thank you so much. And you're changing the lives of so many more. So keep it up. Keep working as hard as you are. Thank you so much. You're a blessing to so many. And I want to make sure you tune in to the next edition of Free Thinking with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear feedback, so please send us your comments.